Hi, this is Paul. Been watching a bunch of Griswold Grimm lately. He's been doing some commentary on me, and I've been doing some comment on him, and we go back and forth. Uh, we also connect on, on Twitter, and he's obviously noticed that I've been paying some attention to Hans Georg Mueller. I'm just trying to get his Mueller. Trying to get his name right. It's, it's if I say if I say Mueller, I, I, I don't know. It almost feels like I'm playing something on TV, Mister Mueller. Mueller. I mean, so my my father could um, speak passable Dutch. My mother could understand a fair amount of Frisian, but our the neighbor ladies, the uh, unmarried senior citizen women. There was a other name that they used to be called spinsters but uh they who lived next door when i was growing up upstairs always told my my mother that she had a dutch she had, that she had an english throat she couldn't do dutch and my father would remark about how when he was young he would try to <laughs> try to get the pronunciation of all these uh, northern european languages correct so mula really stinks that I'm so ADHD to just get stuck on trying to pronounce the guy's name correctly. Anyway, back to the back to the matter at hand. The title of this video is Coming Out as Holiness in the Attention Economy cuz Griswold Grimm asked of Hans Georg Müller, how um is this how he achieved notice? The commodification of philosophy? Um it's been interesting watching his channel. He's obviously working with some partners who are doing his video editing. In my experience, most academics spend a lot of time with books. It's their job. They don't do much video editing. Technology is not their strong suit. That's that's sort of the way it is. And so someone else is editing and and doing a bunch of work to put his videos together to give them at least the degree of polish that they have. He could stand a better camera with better autofocus. Um, I recommend a Sony a6400 with a fast lens. Anyway, commodification of philosophy, philosophers versus influences. Professor Mueller did a critique video of the philosopher YouTube's old video on Kant, but of course he did that critique like a day or two before um, philosophy tube came out as trans and that will send the YouTube algorithm through the roof. And so my comment back to Grizz was, if someone is of a certain category, their work is above critique and anyone who gauge, engages in that critique, regardless of timeline, is therefore subject to censure, but also attention and the reward of attention. And this is some of the ironies of our present attention economy in that once you, once you create the holy, you also create the heretic, and the heretic is always going to get a lot of attention. And so we see this playing out again and again and again. If you want to, in fact, construct the holy, you will co-construct the devil, and the devil will get his due. And the devil will get his attention. That's simply how I think consciousness in some ways works. You have the you have the tit and the tat. You have the back and the forth. You have the response and the counter response. I mean, back and forth we go. Now, why making a response video right before the philosophy YouTuber comes out as trans would boost your video's clout, apparently, learning from my um, new knowledge of bachelors in paradise, that is the chosen word for power in the attention economy, clout. Buzzwords are holy words, and this goes all the way down to the words that we choose and the buzzwords that we have and how in this attention economy buzzwords are holy words because in many ways the public is sort of the stand-in for the divine. And that's why we have this knowledge, we have this fight over public knowledge in modernity, which in many ways really is a fight about status hierarchies, and it is a fight about the divine and the sacred, because by definition, the divine and the sacred is the thing on top of your hierarchy. But once you put something on top of your hierarchy, well, then you're going to have something at the bottom of the hierarchy or against the hierarchy. So buzzwords can easily become the word of God, even for the secular. Now, Word of God is always sort of a functional title or can be a functional title, even as new atheists work hard to deconstruct it. In other words, 
once you have a buzzword, you create a holy word. And once you have a holy word, you've got a hierarchy and something's going to be on top and it's going to be sacred for you, whether that be rationality or reason or whatever your buzzword is. This is just the, then this just becomes the word or in fact the logos, which of course Jordan Peterson continues to be uh, pursuing with great ferocity. Your upper register, and if you don't know what I'm talking about with the upper register, it's all these last videos that I've been making, how we have an upper and a lower register, and the upper register of all this mapping tends to be heaven, spirit, mind, eternity, um, perfection, uh, static, you know, very much sort of platonic forms. The lower register tends to be earth, flesh, matter, age of decay, time eating away at everything. Um, things that pass away as opposed to things that endure. Change, change versus changeless. So you have this upper and lower register. There's so many mappings upon these two registers. And that's why, why did I use the word register? Because it was formless enough that I could paint my own things on top of it. Now the, the video I just posted today doing the critique of Hans-Georg Müller's video on wokeism caught this, this comment from, I don't read Chinese characters, so I have no idea how to pronounce this name, so you're absolutely safe. Hans's channel was in large part motivated by disgust with commodification of YouTube via a philosophy via YouTube. This would be the actor philosopher type spread tube philosophy influencer. So ContraPoints is, of course, the you know, the, the big monkey on top of that hierarchy. This is reflected in the extra effort he puts into his production versus other academics. Ah, since Paul found him, I, I suppose he's talking about me. It's interesting to see his evolution to creating regular content. I wonder how long before a colleague makes a YouTube calling him out. Because that is the nature of academia. You can't say anything about Immanuel Kant and a whole bunch of other people saying, oh, I'm not sure you really got that quite right. And on and on we go. That, of course, is the nature of philosophical discourse. And it's also the nature of religious discourse. And his, his part of what Hans-Georg Müller's interest in me is he's deeply religious, even though he sort of sidesteps religion in, in the modernist way as religion being this thing that has to deal with the supernatural. But he's got a lot more nuance with that as he talks about civil religion, which is sort of religion down below, religion without the supernatural. And I think he's exactly right about that. But when he entitles a video that says why we need a new enlightenment, well, we're playing with religion here. Because Kant, you know, it was very interesting. I've really been enjoying his videos. He made the point that what, what Kant really wanted was, well, we seem to be doing really well with these natural sciences and the technology, and it seems to be giving us a lot of the good that we want. Well, why can't we do the same with religion? Well, let's 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 look at philosophy and let's step aside from the Protestant the Protestant Roman Catholic fights that had been consuming Europe for years. Let's let's step outside of the dogmatism. Well, there's another buzzword, and therefore also a holy word. And let's, let's see if we can, well, what are we looking for? With science, well, science is sort of just another word for knowledge. We just dress it up. But, of course, this is all language game. Kant wanted to see religion or the upper register knowledge have the same certainty as science. And not just the same certainty, but the same wieldability, let's say. And if we can get really clear on the upper register and the stuff above, well, then maybe we can command and control the lower register even better. And that's in some ways part of the, the beauty of math and the beauty of physics. And, you know, you're, you're more getting towards upper registers when you talk about things like laws of nature. You're, you're moving your way up towards the upper register and you want to get it to be very static until, you know, someone comes along and says, well, there's... These things tend to change a little bit. Well, maybe they're not quite as high as we want them to be, but they're really looking for sort of the same bang as technology and in some ways looking for the same kind of certainty. And once we have certainty, we have wieldability. And once we have wieldability, then we can be masters. Then in a sense, we can be God. Now, Nate Heil sent me a really lovely essay called On Gods and Laws, which will 
appear in a video coming up soon. I'm making this video because I'm going out to lunch with Freddie and friends, um, and I just don't have a lot of time to make videos today because Freddie and I have a lot of errands we need to run. So that's just that's just my life as a pastor, and so um, you know, YouTubing must suffer when on the ground things need attention. It's just the way it goes. Now, one of the interesting things about wokeness is that is the strident anti-traditionalism of it. You know, almost everything needs to go because everything is simply permeated with patriarchy and white supremacy and uh, gender binary. And so you sort of have to sweep it away. But in that grand sweeping away of everything, well, you're sweeping away a whole lot of your past sacred, so you very quickly have to rush in and and create new sacreds as you're as you're hurling down the stream of of postmodernity like someone on a river raft trying to take a still picture. Um, now, as I mentioned in my critique, if you're going to talk about Robert Bella, definitely hit civil religion, the essay he wrote in the '60s, but also definitely hit habits of the heart the book he wrote in the 80s, where he talks about expressive individualism, which is probably where we're beginning to see the um, emergence of the secret sacred self in the form of expressive individualism or Sheilaism, as Bella called it in his book. Um, this has sort of forced me back into... Uh, why, can't I, why, can't, why can't book titles just come right off the top of my head? It's because I get confused with all the H words, high on God. And I always think holy first. No, 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 that's not it. It's not holy. It's high on God, um, where he begins up talking about homo duplex, which is, of course, Durkheim's, I think, brilliant observation that humanity is always navigating the tensions between the individual and the communal, especially because in many ways, in terms of the higher and lower register mapping, the community sort of heads up to the upper register. And with the lack of sort of a, well, the, the communal always has, the communal always has a deep connection with the upper register because together, publicly, we feel sufficiently vindicated and validated to speak of the holy, to speak of the divine, to speak of the, the meta-persons, as in that Laws and Gods piece that, that Nate Heil pointed me to, to speak of all of these registers that modernity wants to quickly dismiss so that we alone at the top of the modern hierarchy can be the only persons we know of in existence. And therefore, the more we get upper register sciencia wieldable, then we can dominate and control the world. But of course, we're going to have to fight with all the other homo sapien bipeds that wish to aspire to the top of the monkey heap. So homo duplex really maps onto community, public, social maps into the heaven, heavenly upper register. And, and again, another terrific idea that he passes along in that book of minimally, minimally counterintuitive ideas, which I think gets into this critique of um, of transhumanism with respect to with res well, with respect to minimally counterintuitive ideas or sometimes ideals. In other words, a woman in a man's body is minimally counterintuitive, whereas a horse in a man's body is sort of maximally counterintuitive, or a god in a man's body now seems outdated. Now a sense of uh, now we have the sense of the holy, which we certainly need because we need it functionally in our world, and we're going to have to achieve it somewhere. So it's buzzwords or holy words. It's the only way we can do it. As we're river rafting down this stream, trying to take a still picture, and and we get hints of the secret sacred self, and we hope to find them in ourselves. And and part of why we hope that it's sacred, um, sacred is that maybe if we achieve it, we will in fact become divine. And we will, in fact, become divine and rule over the hierarchies of the other homo sapiens around us. So it's the he, she who must not be criticized or touched. They may not be deconstructed because that, of course, is the great sin to deconstruct or to cast doubt on the transhuman. Because if you cast doubt on the transhuman, you cast doubt on the project, the sacred project of, trans of transcending the physicality and the transhuman. Because after all, buzzwords, buzzwords are holy words. So some of you who cry out for shorter videos, your day has come. 
And once again, this shorter video is sort of a summary of a bunch of other things and a bunch of things coming together. And I hope you like it. I'll post it tomorrow because I don't know if I'll have anything else to post tomorrow. So there you go. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think.